Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Four Seasons Speech Series, Winter, My Journey to Stockholm, featuring Professor Sir Fraser Stoddart. It's my honor to welcome Director Xiao Wei Yuan, the, the director of Moskase. Let's welcome Dr. Yuan. Good afternoon. I'm really glad to be here. And it's an honor for Moskase, Ministry of Science and Technology, Center for Global Affairs and Science Engagement, to co-host with NTU, General a Center for General Education uh, to have this speech. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. I'm so glad to see all the young people, young faces here. So what is Gasse? What Gasse has been doing? Let's watch a videotape. Mm -hmm. Ministry of Science and Technology, Center for Global Affairs and Science Engagement. Gasse plays a critical role in facilitating global partnerships with diverse scientific research institutions. GASE focuses on eight different research highlights. By inviting prominent thought leaders and renowned scholars to Taiwan, GASE thrives to enhance local and global scientific research partnership, encourage international exchange of talents, and maximize the power of Taiwan's scientific development. GASE is dedicated to foster international cooperation, strengthen expert linkage, and organize most global summits. To nurture future talents, GASE connects global network and university to host workshops, seminars, and annual thematic summer program for students. Here are 15 GASE Steering Committee University members in Taiwan. To strengthen scientific global network, there are 17 overseas science and technology divisions in 13 countries under most. GASE, your gateway to innovation and global connection. Welcome our senior executive vice president, Dr. Jia Pei Zhou, to give us an opening remarks. Dear Professor Stordat, Minister Chen, Academic Shen Hong, Director Yan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my great honor to give the warmest welcome to today's event. On behalf of the organizer, Most Gasse, and NTU General Education, we would like to say thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Today's speech speech is rather special for several reasons. As the last event, of the year for both GASE's four season ser speech series and the general education center of NTU lecture series, the two organizers decided to join the force by inviting Professor Stodat, our Nobel laureate, a, well, a world class master scientist in chemistry and nanotechnology, and an enthusiastic educator. With his generous presence today, I'm sure this calendar year is definitely going to end on a very high note. Lectures on the intellectual and the spiritual pledge pilgrimage launched 23 years ago in 1977, which I believe is older than some of the young guys in this room. It is a special lecture series under the university's general edu education program. The purpose of this lecture series is to give positive inspiration 
and the encouragement to students and also individuals by featuring renowned leaders across all fields to share their story to success. What, what inspired them to this complete achievement and also the challenges they encountered and their valuable advices to the work and also to our lives. This series has hosted more than 100 experts, scholars, and the leaders from around the world. It is a wonderful platform for the audience to gain motivation and the knowledge through face-to-face -face interaction with these leaders and the influential thinkers. I'm very thrilled and excited to see the lecture hall filled so many people, especially young students. You are anticipating to hear from the master of chemistry. You have made a very, very good decision to come to the audience hall today, although the outside weather is kind of chilly. I believe all of you will have a very fruitful afternoon. Last but not least, I wish you all the best from my heart. Thank you very much. Before we welcome up <coughs> Professor Stordat, I would like to take this opportunity to invite another very special guest here with us today. Let's welcome Minister Liang Ji Chen of Ministry of Science and Technology to give us the welcome remarks. Let's give him the warmest welcome. Thank you, uh, Exotic VE, uh, Professor Zhou, our distinguished guest, uh, Professor uh, Stuart, and uh, today's uh, organizer, uh, Peng Xuming uh, Fu Xiaozang, and also the organizing team, uh, led by Dr. Yin Xiaowei Jiao Shou. My dear uh, NDU College and uh, dear uh, audience, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm. On behalf of Ministry of Science and Technology, I would like to uh, show our sincere appreciation for the organization team to have this opportunity to invite our distinguished speaker come to NTU, especially come to Taiwan, to deliver this uh, so inspiring speech. As uh, Director Shen just mentioned, CASE is uh, established by most uh, last year. The purpose is to try to uh, uh, fulfill the global uh, networking, especially Taiwan, we are a large, uh, large country with uh, very just little resources. The only uh, resources we can rely on is the talent, the brain. So the important is uh, the brain need to have uh, more global networking and try to uh, have a more young generation to have a uh, science engagement. So the case the main is the global affair and also the science engagement. And uh, we are very really appreciate that uh, all the members of the CASE uh, organized a lot of uh, very inspiring and uh, excellent activity during the years. Especially, we just finished the Global Science and Technology Leader Forum. We invite a lot of uh, leaders come from overseas to uh, help the uh, policy decision and all the uh, very good uh, advisement of the, from the science and technology issue. I think uh, as uh, uh, Professor too. The speech is uh, more than important and exciting for the uh, young generation. So uh, the so-called uh, four season speech is a very uh, outstanding arrangement. And for this winter, we have the excellent speaker come from uh, Stockholm. So the speech today, I think, is uh, a very hard touch actually. And especially when I see the uh, CV from Professor Studer. I understand he's uh, come from a farmer. Too. I'm the farmer too, so uh, <laughs> I can have the feeling as a, uh, when, I, when you are the child food, you don't have uh, any resources. The only one you can get is reading and uh, love the science and technology. And science and technology make us different. So I think uh, it's a uh, very uh, thank God that you can. Uh, 
spend time to uh, deliver your experience. Uh, we have a very uh, uh, usual word, we call it Yi Jin Yi Xi Tan Sheng Du Shi Nian Shu. Translated to English is uh, 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 a very short uh, conversation with the master. It's better than 10 years of uh, reading. So I think all the audience uh, come today to so try to enjoy the, the conversation with uh, our master today. So I wish all the audience today don't uh, waste your time. Uh, try your best to have a conversation with our master. And uh, as I say, science engagement is uh, very important for us. So I'm very happy to see that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, senior high school students come today to join us. Uh, young generation is all our hope. So we hope that uh, all the young generation can understand the, the real world, especially the world, the environment right now, got a lot of change. Some of, some of the change we say is come from the human behavior. However, I think all the real human behavior, the changing of the human behaviors, is come from the progression of science and technology. So in one way, we try to hope that the country can have a more generation to enter the science and technology help our economic growth. However, we also hope our environment can be protected, sustainable for a long time. So actually the world is uh, facing a lot of global, so-called global challenges or grand challenges right now. And all these kind of grand challenges, because it comes from the science and technology, the impact of science and technology, definitely they need to have a science and technology people involved and try to work together to face the global challenge. So I think uh, that's why we say the young generation is our hope, not just for the economic growth, but the hope all the young generation can understand how important the environment for us, how important the environment protection is important for human beings. And all the solutions need to come from science, need to come from technology. So I, I hope today's uh, speech uh, I saw some of the information, it uh, really inspired me, and I hope uh, all this, uh, this English case speech can also inspire all the audience today. And uh, of course, I should give a uh, applause and I mentioned to a uh, professor student. I was the professor, uh, I'm still the professor right now. However, right now my time is almost donated to the government, so every minute. So, so I don't have the chance to listen to the talk. Uh, need to have a rush to another meeting. But I will see the video and uh, try to listen some of the new experience too. So I hope and uh, wish all the audience can enjoy the talk today and uh, wish uh, Professor Stewart can have a nice day in Taipei. Thank you all the audience come to. Thank you. of uh, NTU Chemistry Department, and he will introduce today's keynote speaker. Good afternoon. It is really my great honor and pleasure to chair the lecture by Sir Fraser Stoddard this afternoon. And also, I'm honored to give a short introduction for Sir Fraser Stoddard. Here's the first one. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, okay? And got his PhD from University of Edinburgh, in the main city in Scotland. And started his postdoc and career in 1970 and become the chair at University of Birmingham. Then he moved to United States in 1997 as the Saul Winstein Chair Professor at UCLA. And my colleague, outstanding colleague, Chou Shen, just to get admitted to UCLA and joined the group 
of President Stoda in 1997. I have become a director of California Narrow Assistance Institute and another move to Northwestern University in 2008 as the board of the Chinese professor at Northwestern University and near now. And the uh, award he got from this, from 1999 ACS Arthur Cobb Scholar Award, Nagoya Gold Medal, Feynman Prize, Albert Einstein World Award, Tetrahedron Prize, Baby Medal, and uh, another other Cobb Award, Royal Medal for, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and uh, centenary prize winner of Royal Society of Chemistry. Most important one is the last one, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, by the design and synthesis of mountain machine. Another side for Nobel Prize, Professor Sovak, Professor Stoddard, and Professor Feringham get the Nobel Prize. And, uh, Professor Stoddard has uh, also, in addition to the academic, he has the great impact <laughs> in economic. This is the uh, uh, Professor Stoddard used the name of the novel of his uh, cosmetics, containing organic narrow tubes loaded with ingredients that reverse the skin damage and reduce the appearance of wrinkles in the head. <laughs> Many ladies will be interested in that. And he holds an urgent appointment at the Tianyi University, mainland China. So after he won the Nobel Prize, Tianyi University held a big symposium to celebrate and salute to Professor Stoddard in 2017. And he Professor Stoddard. Luckily, I was invited to attend this big conference and in the uh, Tianjin for three day conference. And we take another picture together, <laughs> Professor Stoddard and Sen <laughs> Sen Chu and me at the same meeting in the lunch time, uh, in the dinner time. Okay? So that. <laughs> And we have also the similar poster. This poster was distributed in the campus for more than months or so. And I just took the chance to have my picture together with this poster, okay? <laughs> Let's welcome Professor Stoda. Okay. Now, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for your uh, memorable introduction. That was uh, you played a blinder. Um, so the vice president, uh, if she's here, uh, maybe she had to leave. I don't know. And uh, the director of uh, GAST, um, thank you very much, along with uh, Professor Chu. Sorry, <laughs> distinguished Professor Chu. <laughs> for the invitation to be here. I'm absolutely delighted to be back in Taiwan. It's far too long since I was here. It was almost 18 years ago, at the beginning of 2002. In fact, the dates are February 24th through 29th. So um, you've been very patient if you wanted me to come back. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. All right, so let me get started with my story. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about the journey um, that started off uh, in uh, Scotland uh, on a farm. Uh, this is the house that I went to when I was six months old in November of 1942. Uh, it was the middle of a war. Uh, my parents uh, only rented this farm for 25 years and uh, here was my bedroom window, and from that bedroom window, I could look out on the yard, 
And I found it obviously with the sheep dog. This was the dairy. This was the wash house. This was the uh, uh, boiler house. This was the coal house. This was the stable. And then there was many other uh, pieces to the steading as well. Notice the horse trough. And also this area here. This is where I became, to begin with, an engineer. Because the first motor cars, the first tractors, were not very efficient. And you had to strip them down every six weeks or so remove carbon from the cylinders and the plugs and then put them back together again. You don't know how uh, the young people efficient the motor car and all these other vehicles are today. Uh, amazingly not so. So down on the farm, there's my parents. Uh, I uh, was an only child. Uh, highly supportive parents. Uh, they sacrificed an enormous amount for my schooling and we had no electricity until I was 18. So I was brought up with uh, oil lamps and uh, sometimes candles. A mixed arable farm, which meant that we grew almost everything, both crops and animals. As a young child, I was very much free to young, run wild. Uh, we invented games. Um, we were uh, encouraged to each other to uh, take risks. and. Uh, Eventually, as I got older, there was a lot of hard work being on a farm. But there was always reward for effort. Good food. <laughs> now, um, in 1950, I'd been to a village school for three years. I went to a college in Edinburgh. And uh, I have to say, I didn't realize it at the time, but I had a great general education. It was about seven generations removed from the time of the Scottish Enlightenment. So Edinburgh was the Athens of the North back in the end of the uh, 18th century. There was uh, David Hume, the philosopher. There was Adam Smith, the economist. There was uh, Joseph Black, the chemist. There was James Watt, the engineer. And there was Robert Burns, the poet. Uh, so I really look back on it as a, a great high school education where I had terrific teachers. Uh, they were half women, half men. It was a great mixture in terms of diversity. And they could have been professors. Uh, they wore ridiculously black uniforms. Uh, you see this handsome man here? And then repeated here? Believe it or not, that was me. <laughs> With hair. Uh, sports were emphasized. And even a little bit of army training, which I think we can all relate to here in Taiwan. Uh, what subjects? Latin, French, English language literature, history and geography, mathematics of course, physics and chemistry, philosophy, music, uh, art, you name it. Uh, in 1916 I went to Edinburgh University and here is the chemistry department as it looks today. Uh, I had a four year course uh, taking uh, chemistry honours in 1964. And uh, I then continued for two years to uh, get my PhD. And during that time, uh, I was the member of a very small group. You can see with my everyday supervisor in the middle, um, <coughs> and uh, another five of us with, again, that rather handsome young man on the right-hand side. Uh, <coughs> so when I came to leave Edinburgh, then with my PhD, uh, this wonderful man, Sir Edmund Hurst, uh, was uh, kind enough to bring me into his office and he said, as I left, uh, whatever you do, Stoddard, identify a big problem. And I had no idea what he meant, but we'll see what happens. Uh, <clears throat> so before we leave Edinburgh, here are two papers uh, published uh, with uh, Sir Edmund Hurst and Dr. Anderson. Uh, and you'll see that uh, from the structures, the chemistry is very difficult, or sorry, very different from the chemistry I'm going to describe today. This was the analysis uh, structure layer of plant gums of the acacia species. Um, they uh, <coughs> could be extracted into water and uh, characterized as polymers with, uh, or polyelectrolytes, with uh, galactose, glucuronic acid, rhamnose, and arabinose. And my main contribution to this area was to realize, through doing a very simple 
physical chemical experiment, recording the viscosity, a rather, uh, would we say, concentrated solution, 10% uh, of this gum would just race through a viscometer. And so it had to be a dendritic type of structure, like um, this one uh, here. Right, so I really discovered dendrimers before the time, but I didn't have the wit to be able to, or the knowledge of Greek, to be able to call them such. So I take off in <coughs> the 1st of March, uh, 1967, first time at age 25, up in the sky, uh, British Overseas Airways Corporation, and even for the economy passengers, they cooked your food meal on the plane. Can you imagine? Uh, <coughs> I arrive in Canada, full of snow. This is the research group that I joined, headed up, headed up by Ken Jones in the middle here. Um, I don't know this should be able to... Yeah, here we are. Uh, there I am at the back. And uh, you can see another thing, uh, very much male-dominated. There was only one woman in the group. Okay, so that was arriving. And, you know, I'd been thinking on the fight over and so on and so forth about this big problem. And I was given a great opportunity because, you know, this is long before email. Um, we had airmail, this little flimsy blue pieces of paper that went back and forth five or six days across the Atlantic. And uh, Ken Jones had not uh, uh, divulged to me ahead of time that he was going to leave on the 1st of April to go to Brazil, not for a week or two, but for a whole year. And then he had only just left when the Canadian Postal Service went on strike for a whole year. So he was in the background. He just disappeared. And so I had a huge amount of independence as a postdoc. And I went to the uh, <coughs> chemistry department library six weeks after I had arrived in the middle of April. And lo and behold, here was a paper by uh, a man called Charles Peterson. Now he was to get the Nobel Prize along with Jean-Marie Lane and Donald Cram in chemistry in 1987. But uh, back in 1967, this very short one page communication in the Journal of the American Chemical Society just blew my mind because he had made an 18-member ring with 12 carbons and 6 oxygens and it formed a complex with a good one with potassium ions. And this flew in the face of what all my teachers at Edinburgh told me. They said, you can make 5, 6, 7-member rings but forget all about the big rings. Well, Peterson had uh, blown that one apart. And so I got very interested in big rings. And being the person I am, I wanted to make even bigger rings. So I took my carbohydrate experience and from alpha and beta cyclodextrin in a three-step reaction, I got a 30-membered ring and a 35-membered ring. Well, they were good to publish, but uh, they didn't actually show any interesting properties. The other thing that happened while I was in uh, Canada was that I started the writing of a book on the stereochemistry of carbon compounds. And you'll notice that one of the uh, people who, in addition to my mentor, Ken Jones, who wrote a foreword was uh, Ernest Elio. And uh, that book, uh, which was later published in 1971, uh, as I say, was started when I was a postdoc. And it was finished when I went back to the UK to the University of Sheffield to the Department of Chemistry. And Ernest Elio was in great supporter. In fact, he read the whole book uh, and uh, covered the manuscript with red ink. And he really, if I might use a phrase, saved my bacon because I would be hanging my head in shame today if that book had been published without his intervention. So this was because I had the courage at a meeting in Natick in the United States to go up to him, introduce myself and ask him if he would uh, be kind enough to read my manuscript. So always be bold, always be bold. Um, but I get to Sheffield and the heaven sort of falls in because I meet a professor of organic chemistry who I quickly work out is envious and um, resentful 
I'm told, you shouldn't be writing a book. No, yeah? you should be in the lab. Well, I went into the lab, I made the compound, and I took it, because I couldn't run my own NMR spectrum to the uh, NMR spectroscopist, and he said to me, I ran that three or four weeks ago for somebody else. So I worked out that this professor had no creativity. All he was doing was giving the same person, uh, <coughs> or different people rather, the same compound to make. Um, so it was a difficult time. Uh, I didn't see my first graduate student uh, until 1972. It was a seemingly stressful existence. In fact, to be very blunt, it was absolute hell on earth. And uh, my wife had to put uh, my uh, bag in my hand and push me out the door and say, you've got to go to work today, Fraser. We have two daughters, you're the breadwinner. And I was all for uh, uh, giving it a up. Anyway, uh, we did begin some research at that time, and uh, here's a glimpse of it. So this was a marriage of uh, Peterson's crown ethers to my knowledge of carbohydrates. And this is a good way to go forward in research in an incremental fashion. And uh, we were able to carry out, uh, as it were, discrimination at a ground state level, at a transition state level. We were able to uh, look at uh, very nice interactions between 1,3-dioxane rings and benzene rings. Uh, it was quite a pleasurable time. Um, and despite the difficulties I had in the department through these eight years, you can see that uh, come 1979, uh, my parents had uh, <coughs> uh, retired from the farm and were living near a beach in Edinburgh. And you can see I'm building sand castles with uh, my two daughters, Fiona on the uh, uh, <coughs> right here, probably six, and Alison three, and uh, they're surrounded by an 18 crime six. There's the potassium ion. There's the uh, uh, pebbles showing the whole dipole interactions, and here is the carbohydrate component where I couldn't display the stereochemistry. I'm sorry about that. Um, <coughs> all right, so. <coughs> Now, uh, at the end of this era, I got, as we call them in the UK, a gong, or an award for carbohydrate chemistry. And I had the opportunity to write up my story for that period in Chemical Society Reviews. Um, and here you see, uh, I'm still very enthusiastic about uh, going forward and uh, trying to give something to humankind. Uh, so I quote from uh, what is actually George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and ask, why not? The other person that uh, had a great impact on me uh, during that decade was uh, Vladimir Prelog, the Bell Laureate in 1975. And you can see what he said about chemistry. Chemistry takes a unique position among the natural sciences for it deals not only with materials from natural sources, but creates the major part of its objects by synthesis. In this respect, the potential of its creativity is terrifying. So I had realized by this time that I wasn't just studying a science, I had taken up an art form. It could be compared with uh, painting. I could see myself as a Picasso if I wanted to be. I could be compared with um, a sculptor. I could see myself as a Michelangelo. I could see myself as a composer, a Beethoven, or a whatever. And uh, this is the great thing about chemistry. It's about making, and it's about uh, measuring, and about modeling. It's at three M's. But the making component is uh, that enriching component that turns you into an artist as well as a scientist. And so, <coughs> With that uh, background, I'm uh, <coughs> at the end of my first period in uh, <coughs> Sheffield, and how did that come about? Well, before we go there, we had married crown ethers to carbohydrates. I think I'd learned to be <coughs> imaginative in that rego uh, regard. Uh, <coughs> and then <coughs> I had another meeting with one of the grandees of uh, American science, Donald Cram, who was, of course, one of the laureates along with Peterson and Jean-Marie Lane in 1987 in chemistry. And I met him by going to 
New York uh, to the American Chemical Society meeting in 1976. And he lectured to a packed room. There'd be two, two and a half thousand in it. And again, I had the courage, thank goodness, to walk up and introduce myself, thinking he wouldn't know who I was. But he'd already uh, got me in his sights because of what we'd published in The Marriage of Carbohydrates with Grand Ethers. And so he said, you must come up to my room and I'm going to show you my models. And I took the wrong ideas. These were <coughs> molecular models. So he carried around with him space-filling molecular models <coughs> that uh, he could uh, put together plastic, the call, call Cori, uh, I've forgotten, uh, CPK, Cori Poly Colton models. And he carried these around in a shopping bag. Uh, this was very much the way he devised his host test chemistry. So we chatted for two or three hours, and uh, he uh, became extremely supportive for the rest of my uh, career until he died. Um, he arranged for me to spend three months at UCLA, at the beginning of uh, 1978, and uh, while I was there, he also arranged for the Science Research Council and Imperial Chemical Industries in the UK to let me go on a sabbatical, a secondment for three years. And so <coughs> here he is with uh, his wife Jane and uh, with my late wife Norma uh, back in 1991. Uh, now before I go on and tell you about the period of the corporate lab, uh, here's just a little comment about bonds. Uh, <coughs> chemists don't have a monopoly on uh, the definition of a bond. Uh, financiers use it, biologists use it, social scientists use it, anthropologists use it. And it, uh, even if you put the adjective mechanical in front of it, it's not exclusive to chemistry. You'll find it in nature, art, architecture, and you'll also find it in the cinema. <laughs> so, uh, what am I talking about? The mechanical bond can be expressed very simply as uh, two rings that are mechanically interlocked together, that's a catenate or a dumbbell with one ring on it. And uh, I <coughs> have called these, for short, MIMS, mechanically interlocked molecules. And uh, are in fact saying the word comes from Latin, rota, an axis, and um, a wheel rather, an axis and axle. And you can see this counting device, uh, there must be some of you maybe that have uh, used an abacus, yes? Yeah, and then <coughs> here we have catena, the Latin for a chain, and uh, over on the right you see a symbol that we all relate to, uh, the Olympic sign. That's a five catena. Okay, so in 1978 I leave this hell of all of our Department of Chemistry at Tadish. That's absolute misery. Uh, no women on the faculty, I should say, on the staff. Uh, four professors who uh, uh, one of them uh, died during the process because they were at war with each other, morning, noon, and night, and uh, the other three had divorces. It was just a, a terrible time. But I escaped, and uh, by going to uh, the ICI corporate lab, it was a breath of fresh air. It was packed with young, talented scientists who uh, had equipment all around them. It was very well equipped, and the atmosphere was one of intensive collaboration. I joined the catalysis group and I met this young man, Howard Colhoun, I will introduce you to him in a minute, and we took up an area of research called second sphere coordination. And then we picked up on a couple of uh, ICI's products, wipeout weed killers, a 50-50 mixture of dipod and paraquat, and found how we could complex them. And <coughs> we had so many crystals, several batches a day, that we had to uh, involve a very skilled crystallographer, David Williams from Imperial College London. And while I was in the company, of course, I learned a lot about management. So here's the formula for diquat and paraquat. Uh, paraquat is often uh, also called methylologin, and uh, as a 50-50 mixture, uh, ICI, where for many years they've been off the market now, marketing them worldwide because of these properties that you see coming up, namely as 
wipe out weed killers. And so, going back to what happened at the Comfort Lab, uh, a little bit of an introduction. Swiss chemist uh, Alfred Werner, uh, who was a Nobel laureate in 1913 for his uh, work on first sphere coordination of transition metals, um, he uh, had a disciple in the UK, uh, this man, Joe Chap. And Joe Chap had uh, also spent about uh, 10 or 20 years, I've forgotten how long, with uh, Imperial Chemical Industries. And he had bequeathed to the company a veritable, uh, as it were, treasure chest of first sphere coordination compounds like transplanted, cisplatin, and proscenium and iridium are uh, examples. Uh, this was an enormous uh, collection that we had access to. And before I go on, however, let me just put this bit of philosophy in from uh, <coughs> Joe Chack. He wrote in a review, scientific discovery is not yet predictable. If you have an exciting road to follow, do not be put off by those who say there is nothing at the end of it. They do not know. Persevere and enjoy the excitement of exploring the unknown. So that's what we did. And uh, I did it along with, as I say, Howard and David, and uh, David's student, uh, <coughs> Alex Solomon, who's now at St Andrews University. And we uh, looked at this uh, uh, area of second sphere coordination, where at the top you see a transition metal, the yellow is a platinum. Uh, with uh, amine ligands, two ammoniums, pointing up, and a bipyridyl ligand pointing down. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the space-filling uh, molecular models. Uh, and uh, you, on the right-hand side, a cartoon version. And the red is always a pi electron rich system, and the blue, a pi electron deficient one. And this is one of the forces that holds them together. But the main force is actually hydrogen bonding. And it didn't make much width, having seen that one-to-one -one added between dibenzo 30 crown 10, thank you to Mr. Peterson, and uh, the uh, <coughs> structure of dicon. And so we said, if we could form this adduct, surely we can form a one-to-one -one complex with this all-organic dicantine. And yes, we could. So that was the end of an era. Um, I had actually gone to ICI thinking that was my academic life over. I didn't want to go back to uh, the uh, Department of Chemistry at Sheffield, but ICI started to just crumble. The corporate lab was closed down next to no time, and now the company itself does not exist. And so <clears throat> I go back. Little had changed in the department. The wars were still going on. Uh, but I was a little older, and I was able uh, finally to handle the situation. Uh, I'd grown in confidence while I was in the company, and what I decided to do, having approached the uh, senior executives of the university and getting nowhere in terms of the abuse that was uh, being uh, handed out in the Department of Chemistry, I just wrote to the newspapers. Uh, and I wrote on the premise that uh, there was a lot of complaining in Britain at that time about uh, the lack of money, resource to do science. And I said, no, no, it's not a lack of money, it's the corruption that's in the system. It's the fact that these professors are holding all the brass, they're holding all the money, and denying the young people the resource. I became the most hated chemist in the whole of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Nobody liked me. And the next thing, and this is very important today because we're going through another situation in the UK, which is get rid of all these foreigners, okay? And I had the goal to bring in students from the south of Italy, from the middle of Spain, from the north of Italy, from Germany and France, and the senior professors were appalled. Why should you do this? Our students are so much better. Well, it was absolute poppycock. The British students were idle and lazy. They were in the lab for two or three hours and they were drinking beer all night. <laughs> so, here we are. Uh, the foreign students were my saviour. And now they're going to put this in reverse. And their result is England is going to go down the tubes 
at a great rate of knots as Scotland is going to go independent and become part of the European community. That's my prediction. <laughs> Anyway, I did find a lot of supporters overseas, research thrived. Um, the, set, the stage was set for making mechanical interlock molecules and the first catenate broke on the scene in 1989. I ran uh, conferences with my late wife at least one a year and uh, well, at the end of that decade I was ready to leave. But before I tell you that story, let's go back to the chemistry. So, we had worked out during the 80s that uh, a fine ether, which was a constitutional isomer of DB30 uh, crown 10, BPP34 crown 10, complexed with paraquat or methyl biologin, if you like that name. And you can look at that uh, crystal structure with the blue rigid molecule through the ring, and for all the world, you can see it's telling you make a rotaxane or make a catenate. And so we made what became known in our little blue box and found that, yes, it complexes with pi electron rich systems. So we could put blue inside red and we could put red inside blue. So we're sitting ready to go forward uh, to the next step. But before we do, there's just a quick movie of uh, paraquat methyl biology going inside the crown ether. And there's one of dimethoxybenzene going inside the blue box. <coughs> now, um, we had to uh, <coughs> then use all that knowledge uh, and uh, in 89 uh, we took the building blocks up on the left hand side uh, that you can see up here, uh, this dicatide, this uh, bisbromide, three equivalents of the template, mixed them together in uh, acetonitrile at room temperature and magic happened. I assume, and we proved later, that we formed a bipyridinium system because neither of these two uh, blue components looked at this red component until that bipyridinium system was formed and therefore it uh, is the basis for uh, it threading the blue system through the red one switching on non-covalent bonding interactions of which four-fifths are hydrogen bonding and the other uh, one-fifth is um, donor acceptor interactions and they're also weak CH pi interactions. So in this uh, artificial system you've got the same interactions that you have in DNA and in proteins that are rich in aromatic amino acids and we get our first catenate and what was a real shock was the yield. 70% yield. It was a knockout. And <coughs> the crystals just formed on the side of the class. They went down to London. David ran the extra crystal structure and by Jove, it was a, a, a gem. And so you can see from that uh, space filling uh, <coughs> representation that from the northeast down to the southwest, we have acceptor donor, acceptor donor. 3.5 angstroms from each other. We knew that we were sitting at the entrance to a gold mine in chemistry. So, uh, here you see a movie of it coming together when uh, there's a bipyridinium ring for the red ring to get round. So that's the making of the catenate. And then it got even more interesting. As we looked at the dynamic proton NMR spectrum, we could see three different movements, a fast rocking one, a little bit slower pirouetting one, no control over the direction of that red ring around the blue ring, and finally, the slowest of the three, a pirouetting, uh, sorry, a circumrotation motion through the uh, blue ring by the red ring. <coughs> so, it was 1990, and uh, in 89, I had been headhunted by uh, a physicist who was the Vice Chancellor at Birmingham University, Sir Michael Thompson. He had also a chemistry department that had gone into disrepair for roughly the same kind of reasons as the uh, Sheffield one. And he had two choices. He could either close it down or he could make a big investment. Well, he chose to make a big investment and uh, <coughs> I finally became a professor, full professor at 
48 years of age. Excellent students, new laboratories, state-of-the-art equipment, research blossomed. <coughs> we made a micro shuttle in 91, a switch in 94, Olympia Day in 96, and <coughs> I was head of school for four years before I eventually left the United States. Change was dynamic. Uh, <coughs> so the making of uh, a degenerate tour taxi followed the same course as the um, catenade, so I won't uh, belabor it. Uh, it was uh, a longer period of time we had to wait. The template is not so rigid or pre-organized as Cram would have called it. Uh, and the yield at the end of this whole process uh, was about half the yield of the cantony. I should say both of these yields, you can up to virtually quantitative yields nowadays with all kinds of tricks. So here's the making of the uh, Tura taxi. And uh, if we draw it out in a linear way, it was uh, suggestive that we could call it a shuttle because here's a degenerate system where it reads the same from left to right from the top as it does from right to left in the bottom. And that ring is going back and forward in hexadeutroacetone at room temperature, roughly 2,000 times a second. Uh, here's a movie just showing you the progress of the ring back and forth between these two sites. And so we published this uh, story in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in uh, 1991, and uh, there were four sentences by way of a conclusion. And I was prevailed upon by the then editor of the Journal of American Chemical Society to remove the four sentences that were hype. And I refused. And isn't it a good uh, decision that I made? Because uh, that second sentence, it, so far as it becomes possible to control the movement of one molecular component with respect to another in a tour taxi, the technology for building molecular machines will emerge. And that was the first time I mentioned molecular machines, back in 1991. All right, so uh, now we can uh, look at the movie showing uh, the uh, desymmetrized uh, molecular uh, uh, shuttle with a green unit and a red unit, where it spends more of its time on the green than the red. And here's the... Um, uh, chemical uh, <coughs> constitution. It was a benzidine unit we chose for the green unit, the biphenyl for the red one. And uh, we could turn it into a switch by protonating the green unit and uh, all the um, <coughs> blue ring would go to the biphenyl unit thanks to physics, columbic repulsion. So under pH control we could control the site of that ring. <coughs> and so here's the uh, movie just showing that when that happens, it all goes and sits on the red ring, and then when you add um, base, it comes back to the uh, other ring. Okay, so, so here's the uh, group at one time in Birmingham, and, you know, I'm showing you this because you can see it is genuinely very, very diverse. You have uh, an Indian, a Japanese, an Italian, a German, the Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, uh, a Russian, an Italian, uh, two Australians, I need not go on. Uh, they were the powerhouse that drove the research in Birmingham. And so, in 1997, uh, having been approached back in 1992, when my wife was first uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, I'd been approached to go to uh, UCLA, and it was just impossible even to consider. We had just moved from Sheffield to Birmingham, and uh, we had a bit of a difficult situation coming up in the family. And so, uh, at uh, ultimately age 55, my uh, wife having had a mastectomy uh, in uh, 1994, and the disease started to get worse, uh, she thought, and I thought it would be good for her to go to uh, UCLA and have the uh, uh, expertise of the uh, Breast Cancer Center there. For my part, I go to another country at 55. I say, I'm a glorified assistant professor. I'm starting out all over again. It's a steep learning curve. 
and uh, my very supportive colleagues, and I have great graduate students. Chu, stand up. <laughs> so he was my very first American, in America, graduate student from Taiwan, okay? And uh, collaborations uh, were the order of the day. Um, and I became director of the California Nanosystems Institute. It was a highly productive time, and uh, I was engaged in much travel, but eventually my wife passed away in 2004. So here, I want to make this point. This was a 12-year battle against an insidious disease. I was spending more time in clinics and hospitals during that 12 years than I was in the laboratory. And I had to get a mindset where I could switch off and switch on in different environments. Life is not a bowl of cherries. Anyway, we moved on and in collaboration with uh, Jeff Sink, we looked at drug delivery systems uh, and with uh, Jim Heath at uh, Molecular Electronics. I'm not going to go into these stories because time does not permit. Uh, but here was one of the, I would say, two uh, bold side of the blue in my life. On the 13th of November, the day before that letter, Bob Pierce, the um, <coughs> Council General uh, from the UK in Los Angeles, phoned me up, and the bottom line was. Uh, uh, Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister in the UK, has it in mind to recommend me to the Queen for a, a knighthood. And uh, I wasn't given much choice. He said, I've got to go here and now if you're going to accept it. Um, so I had a difficult decision because I'd never been a monarchist. However, I said yes. And uh, as a result of that, after a six week period during which I was only allowed to tell my only two daughters, uh, news broke and the um, <coughs> then graduate students at UCLA put together this uh, movie with uh, some music and the music is When I'm 64, which I was, uh, written by Paul McCartney and John Lennon. So I hope you enjoy it.
so England is not my favorite country at the moment. So uh, I just refer to her as the Queen of Scotland. So I meet her in June of 2007 and her Lord Chamberlain says, I present to Your Majesty Fraser Stoddart for services to chemistry and nanotology. Oh dear. I have a very sharp knife on my right shoulder and I'm in a cold sweat and I stand up and uh, she looks at me and she says, he got that wrong, didn't he? And thank goodness she got it right uh, because uh, after agreeing, she came back, what should it be then? Nanotechnology. 81, good on her. Uh, <coughs> so I told her she got it right and uh, also that it was about very small things and uh, <laughs> Uh, that was from her, and I put it in terms of the day. dimensions, diameter of a human hair, and then uh, she came back and said that's exceedingly small, and again showed that she had done her homework. You work in America now, I'm told. And that was my 15 seconds with the monarch all over. <coughs> so, um, 2007. Uh, I got the call to go to Northwestern uh, to a very, very uh, nice position, ultimately with a laboratory, a new laboratory that we now call the Research Palace. Terrific students, great colleagues, and great support from King Abdul City of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, because I'd won the King Faisal Prize um, in Science, having uh, gone to Riyadh for the first time in um, <coughs> 2007. Uh, publications, far too many of them in fact, galore, but that's very important for the young people. And then um, invited lectures a lot, startup, back to startup companies. Uh, we saw one of them during the introduction that relates to cosmetics. Serve on the honors committee, and I'll just interject here that even to this day, my assistant and I put out over a thousand nominations and supporting letters for people, for awards and prizes and uh, uh, jobs and so on and so forth a year. That's three or four a day, even at the weekends. It's, I'm very lucky, she's a uh, PhD chemist. So we're able to do that. Uh, I became a fellow of the AAAS and also of, this is not working right now, I don't know what's happened. Um, of the National Academy of Sciences. Anyway, we move on in the hope that uh, it does work better. Is it a battery problem? I don't know. Anyway, we're not to, we want to go on to uh, talk about machines. And uh, although uh, we could make switches, there are a dime a dozen, uh, we need to perform work in the immediate environments so if we're going to produce machines. And so uh, assembling and controlling these synergistically and housed in an interactive and uh, Robust architectural domain actually heralds a game changer for chemical synthesis and nanofabrication. Um, and so, <clears throat> what are we faced with here? We're faced with a situation that was uplifted by the contributions of uh, Ali Trabolsi from the Lebanon. He came to me from Strasbourg, where he had got his PhD in physical chemistry. And uh, what he did was to be knowledgeable of the literature that uh, methyl biology and paraquat had been known way back from the 1930s, uh, thanks to Michaelis, and then in the 60s by Hunig in Germany, to be uh, easily reduced to a very stable radical cation. And Cauchy isolated a crystal structure in the 90s in Houston, and uh, there was further work by Kimon Kim in Korea of a supramolecular nature and also uh, by another player. Um, but the experiment that Ali did was to take the blue box, as I called it, methyl biology, if I call it that now, put it in an inner atmosphere of nitrogen with zinc dust in the C29 trial, and lo and behold, he had a very strong complex of a tristradical tricationic nature. Uh, <coughs> With, uh, okay. So there's the movie, and uh, 
I use the purple to uh, display the fact that it's a trisradical trication. Okay. Well, I think we've gone forward several slides, but it doesn't matter. Um, we've now got a molecular pump that uh, was uh, just leave it at that, Andrew. A bit of work uh, with a. <coughs> cartoon version, uh, and you can see two rings coming on from the left-hand side, one after the other, as a result of reduction and then oxidation. And what is happening is that you're traveling about with energy wells and transition states. And so this is a very, very delicate thing for a chemist to be able to do. This is more demanding than um, designing and synthesizing new drugs, an order of magnitude. In fact, two orders of magnitude times two, 200 times more demanding. And it's a great uh, compliment to the uh, chemists who worked on this now. Uh, hopefully introduce them to you later if the system doesn't break down on me anymore. Uh, here we see another movie with the two rings on. Uh, let's just watch them come on under reduction. Come on, guys. Here they are. Uh, purple. That's reduction, oxidation, columbic forces, jumps over the speed bump and is collected. And then when the second one comes on, the first one wants to come back. So it's a very, very delicate design that you need to uh, go through this whole process of oxidation, sorry, reduction, followed by oxidation, followed by some thermal energy. And then you can repeat this, having got to a tour taxi to get to a free retaxing. Uh, here's the uh, chemical constitution of the so-called molecular pump at the top. And uh, bringing on from the left-hand side is a little blue box. You see some signals. Notice this proton NMR spectrum is being recorded at 42 degrees centigrade. Um, <clears throat> we do a redox cycle with zinc dust, filter it off, oxidize with uh, nitrous hexafluorophosphate, and then we have to wait for an hour and a half for the ring to make its way over the speed bump at 42 degrees centigrade. And the same process is repeated in putting the second ring on, same conditions. And so here's the movie showing the ring coming on under reductive conditions. That's when it's purple. Now it's blue. It's making its way over the speed bump. And now the second one is coming on. And notice the first one wants to come back and has stopped. And then the second one, thanks to Columbic Repulsion, will join it. Okay? And so, uh, what we're doing now is to put uh, micro pumps at the end of very long polymer chains. And we have polysaccharide, uh, sorry, polyprotaxate uh, synthesizers uh, driven by a dual pump, operated electrochemically as a result of the periodic oscillation in an electrochemical cell down on the right-hand side, bringing two rings on at one time. And uh, here's the movie showing what's happening there. And in the interest of time, I'm going to, I think, go to another uh, collection of uh, work uh, described over uh, 35 years. Uh, I think this is coming up to another piece of music. Let's see if I'm right. I've got to define some icons first. Molecular recognition is on according to Fisher's Lock and E when the key is in the lock. Red is a donor, remember. Blue is a acceptor. There's the image uh, or icon for templation. Radicals are purple when they're on. And sometimes we use heat. Uh, sometimes we use electricity and sometimes ratios are not one to one and sometimes we use chemistry and so here we are
So I can look back at it all and say, I have no regrets. So to summarize, the story could be seen as starting earlier, but let's just take it from 91 through 94, the shuttle to the switch to the machine in the last decade. And these are some of the major players, including Andrew Sue, who's down there, another brilliant Taiwanese chemist, Andrew. He's now a professor at Tianjin University in China. Okay, so <clears throat> some of the leading molecular machinists are, uh, of course, my uh, great friends, um, John Gale Savage from Strasbourg and uh, Garb Peringa. Uh, uh, Andrew tells me we're working through the internet, so this is why it's a little bit dicey. But here's Ben, uh, incredible chemist. He's to, uh, <coughs> the Bologna group of uh, Vincenzo Balzani and Alberto Credi, uh, former student David Lee in Manchester, Dina Stumian up in Maine, a great physicist who tells us um, his uh, <coughs> ideas on how to design whoops, molecular machines. Uh, Joseph Nico, Colorado and Prague, uh, Steve Loeb in Canada, uh, Eddie Savick, uh, American working at the Sterling National University, uh, <coughs> Miguel Garcia Academy at UCLA, uh, Raffle Klein at uh, Polish uh, Bioorigin at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, um, Amar Flood from New Zealand at um, Indiana University, and uh, Armenian Ivan Ibrahimian at Dartmouth College, and finally Frenchman Nicolas Chiasaponi. And of course, there are many others, and I just run out of space. Diversity is the name of the game. And sticking with the theme of diversity, uh, oh, okay, um, I'm back with uh, what my professor told me when I left Edinburgh, tackle a big problem. And so I'm not the only person I think that uh, makes these points, but many, many people do. And here's uh, Venka Ramakrishnan, the 20 a uh, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, saying, I found almost nobody there, and he refers to the molecular biology laboratory at Cambridge, where many Nobel Prizes have gone, uh, was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publishable results. Rather, they were trying to ask the most interesting questions in their field, and then developing ways to address them. And I will just interject here, although I've published uh, almost 1,200 papers. That has been done to help the young people go forward and get jobs. And at the end of the day, my publications and my research will stand for very little, but it will be the hundred and odd people like Andrew and like you who've gone into academic life and another two or three hundred into industry, some into publishing and so forth. That will be my legacy, not the papers, not the age index, not the impact factors, none of that rubbish. It will be the people, the people, the people. And so let me encourage uh, particularly people heading into academic life. Uh, just as I did, it took me 20 years, I was very slow to do your own thing. And what does that mean? To achieve something that is impactful and contemporary science is to be singled out as a scientist who leaves their mark on science and ultimately technologies, you need to become recognized widely as having done your own thing. Now, how do you go about this? It says very easy. You just have to have the courage to say, stop, I'm not going to collect stamps for the rest of my life and do miserable, boring research. I'm going to do something that's really different. This goal means that you make a conscious decision to summon up enough courage to tackle a big problem. Thank you, Sir Edmund Hurst. And <coughs> for which no one has provided a satisfactory scientific answer. Tackle a big problem. <coughs> right, so let me wrap up by... Uh, no, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, let's look at uh, two or three slides um, that uh, maybe advice for 
uh, the younger people and uh, people entering uh, <coughs> mentoring research to put teaching of students before research. We're first and foremost professors before we do any research. We're teachers. And in this context, to let students take ownership ultimately of the research of their graduate students or postdocs, and to put your students before yourself. <coughs> to support your students through thick and thin. To identify a line of research that is receiving little attention. To recognize that progress in research will be slow. And to be able and appreciate the significance of a discovery. Don't let it pass you by. Keep your eyes open. And to find out how to manage research, I found that out in a company, and deploy best practice in writing grants and scientific papers. And to set very high standards in presentation, oral and written. And then three things that Stockholm use a lot in reference to me. Uh, you need to have good health. That means you eat well. And here in Taiwan, that's a given as long as you don't go to McDonald's or any of these places, right? <laughs> eat well. Eat your own food. The strength of a horse. The other thing is, if you are on to something that's new, you will have many critics. If only because they're envious and resentful. They will come out of the woodwork. And they never go away. I still have them coming now. Uh, you need the height of an elephant, a very tough skin. And then, when you're on to something that is a game changer, then, whoops, sorry, I blame the internet. What else can I do? You need the work ethic of a honeybee. In other words, it's not enough to demonstrate some new concept once. You have got to do it over and over and over again before it sinks in to the rest of the scientific community. <clears throat> to be successful in life at whatever, treat people the way you'd expect to be treated yourself. Be respectful towards people younger than yourself. Treat people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds exactly the same. Think before you open your mouth. <coughs> Realize we live in a village. We all know each other. And so, don't speak ill of others. If you do, it will come back to haunt you. Be more ready to give than to receive. Be supportive to those around you. And be ready, willing, and able to hand out praise like there's no tomorrow. And work out how to turn really bad things into good things. A pig's breakfast into a sow's purse. And, as Noel Coward said, back in the 1950s, the secret of success is the capacity to survive failure. It's easy to manage success. It's a very much more difficult challenge. And we all have to face it at many times during our lives to manage failure. And this is not <laughs> advice from me. This is from a financier in the US, Warren Buffett, how to be cool. Say thank you. Apologize when wrong. Show up on time. Be nice to strangers. Listen without interrupting. Admit you were wrong. Follow your dreams. Be a mentor. Learning and remembering people's names. <laughs> and holding doors open. So the second bolt out of the blue was at five past four in the morning uh, when I was sound asleep in Evanston when the phone rang. And later that day, it was followed up by a letter from uh, the Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that uh, I would be sharing the 2016 Nobel Prize for the design and synthesis of molecular machines with Jean-Pierre Solange and Ben Ferenga. Oops. So, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, I had a really uncomfortable time at Northwestern and 
2016. In the February, I had seven or eight lawyers in my room, and uh, I won't go into details, but um, I had already decided I was leaving. I was going to probably go down to Texas. And so uh, when this announcement came, the hierarchy at Northwestern were caught off guard. And so they had to move like grease lightning. And uh, posters appeared at uh, almost the speed of light. Uh, here's going in one entrance uh, to my office and lab. Here's going in another. Uh, they decorated the arch. <laughs> and so we took a photograph of the group at that time. Come on, yeah. There they are. Um, and then in the front of the so-called tech building. But if we're lucky, the one that beat all, and that was 24 hours, that's all it took <laughs> to get my own parking spot. <laughs> and then <laughs> I become uh, the source of some uh, very playful uh, comment from my good friend Ben Faringa, because he goes to work on a bicycle, and so he upgrades my car, which happens to be a Toyota Camry, sorry, it's now a Toyota Corolla, so a very small thing, to a Maserati. Um, and so he's making a big song and dance about his bicycle, and so now that I'm on better terms with the uh, President of the University, I asked for a bicycle parking spot. And uh, I get a place to park my bicycle, but I don't have a bicycle. <laughs> and I don't even know if I could, at that time, ride a bicycle. But about 18 months from the Chinghua campus uh, in Beijing, you could rent, rent a bicycle. And I just want to prove to you that after 40 years of not riding a bicycle, it's second nature, I can ride a bicycle. <laughs> uh, I think the prize was generally well received. There's the American Chemical Society going over the top. They dress their seven-story building with our uh, photographs and uh, some statistics, of course. Uh, <clears throat> and then we slipped into uh, the White House and the Oval Office just in time. That was the 30th of November, I think, uh, 2017. And there you see me with, uh, I don't have to tell you who that is. That's a real president there. Uh, um, with my elder daughter, Fiona, beside him, and Alice and my younger daughter. Um, and there we are in the Nordic Museum with the whole family. So let me just point out that uh, my elder daughter is uh, married to an Australian, that's uh, Quentin, and whoops. Uh, that's my eldest grandson, my only granddaughter, James and Kate. And then Alice is married to a boy whose family came from Hong Kong. So there are three boys, and uh, these two are twins, and this is the little rascal, Harry. Harry was only five when we were there. And he now says to his parents quite regularly, can we go back, Mummy? I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see what comes next. Now, receiving a medal from the king, and uh, there it is, in all its glory. And there's <laughs> Thomas holding it, uh, little Harry holding it, and this is William not showing his face. And then, I hope you enjoy this little recording with uh, the okay, Swedish broadcasting system. Uh, what a lovely speech that was. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, I thank hope you. I uh, resonated with uh, everyone and all those outside looking on. I hope so. Yes, yes. did. So, as we can see, you got the advice to bring all the young ones to yes, Stockholm. Yes. So, was this good advice? Oh, absolutely. This was terrific advice. Uh, these youngsters will remember these few days for the rest of their lives. And they will, I think, probably go on with more self-esteem, more self-confidence, and uh, 
who end up uh, being more successful in their lives as a result Future of Future Nobel laureates. <laughs> yes. What about you kids? Did you have fun? Did you have fun tonight? Oh, yeah. This, this night was probably one of the best nights of my life. It was? Really? <laughs> so what was the best thing about tonight? Eating the chocolates. Do you agree? Yes. What about you? What do you say? I like the singing. The singing was really nice. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. We can go and eat Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And I cannot imagine how he translates the complex chemical formula to cartoon. Okay? And uh, he has so many advice to the young people and let uh, give a big hand again for the wonderful lecture. <laughs> now we are open to the Q&A section. That's right, this is the best part of it. Okay, okay, see that? All so right. we are allowed to have 20 minutes of Q&A section. Now it is open. Young people, roast me alive. Come on, ask me with these questions. questions. Yeah. Okay, you, who raised the hand first? Well, two, three, like my homework, huh? <laughs> I have to follow. You are? Oh, okay, the young person. <laughs> Hi, Professor Soda. Hello. Thanks for your excellent uh, slide and speech. Uh, I do apologize for the jerkiness, but uh, the um, internet, um, I didn't have control of it. It's okay. Um, okay, go on. Um, to be an excellent chemist, you must have devoted many times in research how to keep balance between um, family, life, and research. Well, it's always a challenge, and um, it uh, changes as you go through the various different seven ages of man, to quote Shakespeare. Um, you know, when you start off, you have, uh, generally speaking, quite a lot of independence. You're probably single. Uh, you may get married. I got married at 26. Um, I was very lucky. I uh, found a woman who was much smarter than I. She turned out to be the best of undergraduate student in Edinburgh in her year, two years after me, in uh, 1966. Uh, my two daughters also ended up with first-class degrees from Cambridge and from Imperial College London. And I was really the dunce of the family. Uh, you get it? You know, I was the, the lower species. Um, actually, I spent a lot of time working on the farm. That's the excuse. Um, <coughs> But as you go through the different stages, so you then have a young family, you have to uh, spend some time with them, of course. Uh, but uh, my wife was very understanding, and we, we came to a very quick decisions. So we didn't both go to the supermarket. One would go or the other would go. So we were efficient in the way we handled uh, running the family. Um, and then as time went on, of course, I had to face the fact that uh, 
uh, this woman I love fell foul of uh, breast cancer, and that was a set in my talk, a 12-year battle against uh, an insidious disease, and uh, half my time was at clinics and hospitals, and uh, I had to come through that uh, experience, uh, and, you know, my research group were absolutely marvellous. The young men and women supported me uh, through thick and thin. Um, and then after that, quite frankly, I decided I didn't have the courage to get married again. Uh, so I had been a boy brought up in the wilderness as an only child, uh, being able to look after myself and to uh, not meet people around me was uh, in my genes, I think. So uh, here I am, single, so I'm able to roam around the world and uh, do what I wish. I spend very little time even back at uh, Northwestern University. We flew 365,000 air miles last year. Terrible carbon footprint, of course. And uh, probably more this year. So, you know, it all changes as you go through. And as far as so-called research is concerned now, I've more or less uh, outsourced all the creativity to the young men and women in my group. And my God, they're doing a great job because they're doing their own thing. Where do I come into it? I come into it with the quality control that's necessary because many are from mainland China. And, you know, they need help with uh, publishing in the English language. And so we can sometimes go through five drafts, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's almost 50 until we get the perfect manuscript. And I can do that when I'm in a hotel, anywhere in the world, or traveling on a contraption in the air. Um, so, you know, the whole thing has changed from uh, the early period through to now. It's a dynamic experience. And uh, yes, you have to try and keep that balance. And you have to try and uh, do the best that you can, uh, looking after your personal life and your uh, professional life. Thank you. Okay. Who raised the hand? The, the, the one before? Yeah. Um, thank you for your speech. And I, I'm still in high school, but I'm thinking about like a career in science, and I'd like to ask it. Like, how do you see the fact that there were very few women like, in your um, scientific career as colleagues? And Sorry, come like, again. Um, like, how do you see the fact that there were rather few women mm -hmm. um, as your colleagues? And do you, do you think that there is discrimination against women like in the scientific community or that it's harder for women to find recognition? Okay, well, I think it's a dynamic situation. The first thing I would say is that uh, I have two daughters, um, and they've both got uh, PhDs in chemistry. So our family did the bit, uh, did their bit, uh, to, to uh, uh, promote uh, women. Uh, and one of them is now the editor of Nature Reviews Materials. It's a new uh, Springer Nature Journal. And uh, coming back to these wretched uh, metrics. Her impact factor is 75, which is the second best in the world. Her father is very proud of her. Okay, so I promote women all the time. And uh, you know I'm on Twitter. I'd be called the Twitter monster. And uh, you know, sadly here in Asia, people will organize conferences that are all male. And immediately there's a storm on Twitter, quite rightly so, because there's no reason to, to, to organize an international conference unless it's close to 50-50 these days. There's an enormous number of incredibly talented women. And um, the biggest problem, I think, for them is, well, I said there's an enormous number. Relatively speaking, there's many more men. And so their problem is they get proportionately more invitations and locally. I mean, somebody was commenting to me that here at uh, NTU, there's only a few women in the chemistry department, and so they can't escape being on uh, 
committees and so on and so forth, which is not really all that good from the point of view of teaching and doing research. So there's upsides and downsides to all of this. Um, but I think we're getting closer to uh, an equilibrium situation. Certainly, we say in the United States and probably in uh, some of the European countries. I think Asia is a little bit behind. There are plenty of women that have been trained in uh, <coughs> undergraduate uh, science degrees and other degrees, but um, do they stay uh, and go through to be uh, professors? That, that's the big uh, challenge now, I think. So uh, stay the course. It is worth it. And, uh, you know, map out your life in a way that uh, you can even have children and uh, manage it, uh, provided uh, you have uh, someone who is uh, supportive alongside you. Um, it can be done. My wife and I did it. You can do it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, here you go. Please give the... Give it to me. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, President Slaughter, for the amazing... Thank you. Thank you for the amazing and inspiring speech for that time. And then, uh, I want to ask, uh, during the academia research time, and how do you get, in, get over to the difficulty of, of getting into the unknown research uh, field in the uh, biochemistry or in the science level? You mean getting to the point where I tackled that big problem? Yes. Okay, well, it was a slow process, um, partly because I was inhibited by the elder statesmen uh, back in England. And, you know, I've forgiven them now. Uh, the, the point was I was incredibly well supported by the uh, American uh, elite, uh, Ernest Elliot, Kurt Mislow, Don Cram, uh, David Goodshire, Donald Bush, the list goes on and on. Wonderful people. Um, and so that was a great boost to me, the fact that uh, I could have not a good situation for a period at home. Uh, you know, I eventually got to the point where I could tell the professors who were not supporting me back in the UK, I said things like, you can say what you like, but when the jet plane crosses the border between England and the country I'm going to, my reputation shoots up like this, and you just have to watch the expression on their face. The professor of organic chemistry, one day, after I came back from uh, ICI, called me into the room. You know, I think he was living in the verge of sanity, insanity. And he said, you've got to get all your research students out of that laboratory by five o'clock. And I thought, oh my God. Why was he doing this? And so he asked me to come back after lunch. And I managed to see the dean, but I was kind of wasting my time. Anyway, I had enough courage when I went back. And uh, he looked at me and he said, well, are you going to move your students? And uh, I said, no. I said, they're staying in the lab. And if you insist on this, uh, uh, thread, I will go to the dean. And if I don't get satisfaction there, I will go to the um, registrar, the provost, in American terms. And if I don't get satisfaction there, I will go to the vice chancellor. And I said, if I don't get satisfaction there, I will go to the chancellor. And he looked at me and he said, Dr. Stoddard, nobody has ever spoken to me like this in my life. And I said, Professor Olvis, there had to be a first time. <laughs> I got up, and I went to his door, and I opened it, and I slammed that door the way I've never slammed the door in my life. It must have made him jump out his seat. And I walked along the corridor on the air to my little cubicle of a room. It was called the telephone kiosk by my friends internationally. And would he come after me? No. He was a paper tiger. Okay. 
My only regret was that it took me 10 years too long to face up in that kind of way. Thank you very much. Okay. Almost, uh, okay, that's the... Uh, with one person over there, it's a uh, uh, red. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, because we know the transition of lifetime is very hard. I mean, from, uh, I mean, you go to a brand new campus to set up a new lab, and uh, such transition is, um, we can see so many. Um, condition in your life and how can you make it and because it's since you are glad to embrace such um, uh, such challenge so and I want to know the reason why you can embrace the challenge well I like embracing challenges I'll tell you the story that got me hooked on chemistry it was 1963, it was my third year in Edinburgh, and uh, Ducky Anderson, who we saw a photograph of, he became my PhD supervisor, was giving a course, undergraduate course, in quantitative analytical chemistry. Here's a sample of steel. What's the percentage of iron in it? And in his introduction to a class of, say, 150 of us, he made two kind of outrageous comments. He said, you'll be pipetting with your open mouth enough cyanide to kill the whole of Edinburgh. And you could have heard a penny drop in the lecture theatre, which is unusual in a Scottish uh, chemistry department lecture theatre, where usually if the lecturer is not uh, doing very well, feet start to stamp and you can't hear anything. Yeah? We gave our lecturers a very, very rough time. Uh, and then the next thing it said was, rather arrogantly, I devised this course 10 years ago. It's a 10-week course. Nobody's ever finished it. And I said to myself, and this is the challenge, I will finish that course. Now, I was able to finish it by taking all the things I'd learned on the farm. We had to do half a dozen things almost every day on the farm. We were milking cows, we were feeding cattle. We were lambing ewes, we were sowing seeds, whatever it was. And so I just multitasked. I finished in seven weeks. And that's what got me to the professor's office to meet Sir Edmund Hurst for the first time. And he said, we offered you a stipend uh, to come in uh, over the summer period and uh, work in uh, Anderson's research group. And uh, I have to tell you, I was only days in there when it was a complete addiction. I couldn't get there early enough in the morning and uh, I couldn't drag myself away at night. I just fell in love with uh, the activity of doing research. And of course that has changed its pattern over the years. I don't do it with my own hands now, but I love it as much now as I did then. And the challenge is, I could go on and talk about them. I mean, they're happening as I'm here in uh, Taiwan. At three in the morning, I'm hearing about things that uh, I call them bushfires back home at uh, Northwestern. And I have to uh, stay up until three in the morning. It's getting emails out to try and quell these bushfires. Nothing changes. The challenge is uh, remain with you all through your life. People say, hey, you got a Nobel Prize, life is easy. No, no, no. It's just the same as it was before. Except that I'm traveling 365,000 deer miles a day, and um, it's a rather different uh, dynamic. But there are still big challenges, particularly back at home base, just as they were back in 1963 when I took up one of these first uh, challenges that brought me into research. Okay. okay. Due to the time limitation, I just want to get the last question. The uh, hello, Sir Stora. I'm hello. from Edinburgh University. Oh, good. <laughs> so we are uh, um, we're mates. Yeah. So, um, Professor Eleanor Campbell, I don't know if you know, she told me. Can I just rush in and say it's a much better place now than it was then? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, it was pretty good when I was there too, I have to say. But uh, go on, Eleanor Campbell, I know okay. her. So she, um, through laser ablation of plastics, serendipitously yeah. found fullerenes. Yes. Then I arrived here and Professor Cho's lab, who I now work with, uh, is Professor Cho's serendipity lab. Yeah. My question is this, how has serendipity shaped your research? A lot. I will give you two examples uh, that uh, are of the last decade. So in 2010, we were uh, trying to make something called the Boromian rings. So this is where you put three rings together, and I've only got two hands, so two rings are a ring and ring uh, complex. And then you feed a third ring through where, can you see me? My eye, as I look at you? Imagine that ring was there, and it's broken. These two rings can drift away. So we made this construct with the same chemical constitution, published it in Science in 2004. Ron Smaldone, postdoc from uh, UIUC, uh, wanted to make the boramine rings with different rings. So we started with gamma cyclodextrin, eight sugar guinness in a row, in a ring rather. And he said, I can put two azobenzene nitroboxylates inside, and he used the potassium salt. You got crystals. The crystals made their way across the pond to St. Andrews, just north of Edinburgh, to Alex Sloan, whose picture you saw. And uh, it wasn't what Ron expected. There was no azobenzene. It was a set of uh, six cyclodextrins linked up by potassium into a cube. And then this was extended by other potassiums into an extended structure. So the molecule is the crystal. The crystal is the molecule. And this today, is the one and only metal organic framework, MOF as they call them, that is green, that is uh, benign, and that is edible. And so this has made its way into, uh, it could make its way into uh, personal care, home care, pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, uh, food. We chose, or my CEO of the company, who's an Egyptian, shows uh, personal care and in particular cosmetics. And so fast forward, 22nd of October, we had the relaunch of a uh, uh, line of cosmetics called Brilliant and Absolute, Brilliant for Young, Absolute for Older People, uh, at the Met, Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. A huge number of uh, models, not molecular ones now, Real models appeared, and uh, we had this you know, launch of this new product. One, um, and the person backing it is uh, committed to spending three hundred million dollars over a three-year period to put this at number one. This is his ambition. So we'll wait and see how that happens. So that was a serendipitous discovery. The next serendipitous discovery was in 2013 again in that same arena, because I'm going around the world saying potassium and gamma cyclodextrin give you this wonderful extended structure. It doesn't matter a damn what the counter ion is, it could be fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, acetate, trifluoroacetate, it doesn't matter. I was wrong. Jishan uh, Lu, where is his mentor? Jishan Lu. There is his mentor, see? Professor Lu. YT Lu. Hmm? TY. TY. Got, or switch around. TY. Serendipitous. Serendipitous. So Xi Shang comes up with, I don't know how or why, tetrabromoborate, and eventually finds that alpha cyclodextrin, the one with six sugars, forms a crystal or a precipitate within minutes. And so he's got a way of precipitating gold out that again is green and benign, blah, 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 blah. And so there's another company that is uh, formed called Cyclodex on the basis of that piece of serendipity that, uh, well, uh, I thought it would be the winner because they were both uh, registered in Delaware in the March of 20. Uh, 14 or 13, 
and I will put all my money on the gold one, but it's the other one that's coming through. And the reason is that in the gold mining industry, the big mines use cyanide, the smaller cottage industries, particularly in Africa, use mercury, two nasties. And uh, in particular, the big miners uh, have just told me point blank, they've always used cyanide, we're never going to change, go away, Dr. Sutter. Okay? That's a good example of, uh, it's very difficult to bring disruption to a well-established industry. But since you're a Scotsman, of course, one of the... Uh, I'm English. You're English, all right. But since you were... Applying for a Scottish passport. I know. When they become available. Yeah. And uh, I will be joining you in that Scottish passport. And my younger daughter, who lives in Cambridge with the uh, three little boys that her husband has worked out that she can get for all of them a Scottish passport as well. And so if you have any sense, you will stay in Scotland. It will become a most vibrant, along with Ireland, part of the English-speaking world, the Celtic fringe. And sadly, very sadly, England will just... <laughs> yeah? But uh, on the west side of Scotland, at Kilmarnock, uh, this is where Alexander Fleming came from. And he was the person, of course, on the 28th of September, 1928, at Imperial College London. Had a petri dish with some um, uh, bacteria growing in it. And uh, I had to give it away for the weekend. And he came back, and a fungus had invaded it. And around that fungus, the bacteria had died. That's the story that led to the invention of penicillin, to the um, fact that we then had this age of the magic bullet. Uh, we had uh, antibiotics. And the story is that before that time, I'm sorry to point you out, but both people on your right and your left would not be there, all right? Okay? Because a lot of these people just died in childhood. So that was, you know, transformative. Yeah? Forgive me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just making a point. It happens all around the Lexa Theatre. Two thirds of you would disappear. So that was, again, the serendipitous discovery. And the last point I want to make, based on that, and thanks for raising it, is that the funders, and I wish the minister was still here, uh, they should give up trying to fund directed research and a uh, very, very uh, now uh, international way. What they should do is give the freedom back to the scientists to make their own decisions about what they work on. And if they do that, there will be a lot more serendipitous discoveries. There will be big game changers and research will flourish in a way that uh, would be mind-boggling. So that's my message to the people who are not here. limitation, I'd like to, on behalf of the Center for General Education, National Taiwan University, to show our appreciation for this prac to Professor Sir Fraser Stuttgart. 